Hi, welcome to Mark by Mark A. Foster, PhD. Today we will talk about the subject of Kyriarchy, which is one of the elements of Marxism, Third Worldism, or Maoism, Third Worldism, that I have developed. Um, the term Kyriarchy was coined by Elizabeth Schuster Fiorenza. The name Fiorenza is Italian for little flower. How do I know that? Because my late friend, my late best friend, uh, was Vincent Fiorenza, and he always used to repeat that over and over and over again. So I, so it, it got embedded into my brain. Fiorenza is little flower. Now, I found Kyriarchy to be a fascinating perspective. One, because it aligns with my approach to intersectional Marxism. Main thing, do not confuse intersectional Marxism with intersectionality. Now, obviously, the term intersectional Marxism was inspired by intersectionality. Intersectionality was originated by Kimberly Crenshaw and was then carried over into my field of sociology by Patricia Hill Collins. I once uh, sat on the same panel as Patricia uh, at, a, at a sociology conference many years ago. That was actually before she was known. I found out about intersectionality in a general sense back in 1991 on one of the textbooks I was using called Race, Class, and Gender was co-edited by Patricia Hill Collins. I was not aware of it before. In fact, most sociologists had never before heard of intersectionality. Now it is pretty much of a household term. Um, but back then, no. Back then, it was not known well at all. Um, now, the concept of intersectionality has been developed by, by various individuals, including Ashley Bower, um, who has developed her own rather interesting form of intersectional Marxism. And we will discuss intersectional Marxism at some time in the future and its relationship to um, Marxism, Third Worldism, or Maoism, Third Worldism. But again, please bear in mind, intersectional Marxism and Kyriarchy are not the same as intersectionality. The way in which uh, both, both uh, Crenshaw and Collins proposed intersectionality was as a model, not as a theory meaning it is a way of modeling the way in which groups and uh, various nationalities, ethnicities, races, classes, genders interact with one another. But the precise nature of those interactions can vary from theorist to theorist. So what Fiorenza did is she developed a kind of modification of uh, intersectionality, again called Kyriarchy, and the unique aspect, which, which is actually what appealed to me, of Kyriarchy, was that in addition to the standard three uh, structures that are a part of intersectionality, race, class, and gender, she also included things like hegemony, imperialism, colonialism. In other words, she politicized intersectionality. Intersectionality was originally a, a black feminist theory. It was developed by black feminists, especially Crenshaw uh, and Collins. But, but uh, the way in which Fiorenza developed it was an, in an entirely different way. Uh, to describe uh, the way in which governments, especially, um, act in such a way that, that, that excludes 
certain members of society. Now what I'm about to do is something I don't generally do, but I would do it once in a while before I retired as a professor, and that is to read you a sequence of quotations. Usually I would only read one quotation, but I'm going to read you a sequence of quotations. The first couple are by Fiorenza, the others are by various other authors. So let me get myself set up here for a second, and I will uh, begin reading those quotations to you. This is the first quotation. I have proposed to replace the category of hierarchy with the neologism kyriarchy, which is derived from the words kyrios, lord, slave, master, father, husband, elite, propertied, educated man, and Archean, to rule or to dominate. That's where we get words like, like uh, democracy, for example. In classical antiquity, the rule of the emperor, lord, slave, master, husband, or the elite freeborn, in other words, somebody who's not a slave, propertied, educated gentlemen, to whom disenfranchised men and all women and men were subordinated, is best characterized as kyriarchy. In antiquity, the social system of kyriarchy was institu institutionalized, I can say that, either in empire or as a democratic political form of ruling. Kyriarchy is best theorized as a complex pyramidal system, like a pyramid, like this, <laughs> of intersecting, intersecting multiplicative social and religious structures of subordination and subordination, of ruling and oppression, kyriarchal relations of domination are built on male property rights as well as on the exploitation, dependency, inferiority, obedience of women and men who signify all those subordinated. All those subordinated. All those subordinated! I got it! Such kyriarchal relations are still today at work in the multiplicative intersectionality of class, race, gender, ethnicity, empire, a very popular word in Marxism, and other structures of discrimination. Kyriarchy is constituted as a socio-cultural and religious system of dominations by intersecting multiplicative structures of oppression. The different sets of relations of domination shift historically and produce a different constellation of oppression in different times and cultures. Constellation means arrangement or organization in this context. The structural positions of subordination that have been fashioned by kyriarchal relations stand in tension with those required by radical democracy. A critical intersectional analytic does not understand kyriarchy as an essentialist ahistorical system. Instead, it articulates kyriarchy as a heuristic, which is derived from the Greek word to find concept, or as a diagnostic analytic instrument that enables investigation into the multiplicative interdependence of gender, race, class, and imperial. There you go back to that word imperial referring to empire. Stratifications, as well as into their discursive inscriptions and ideological reproductions. Again, uh, 
that is by Elizabeth Schusser Fiorenza, which is taken from an edited volume. Okay, here is a, another quotation. Uh, this one is actually by Natalie Osborne, but it does discuss Kiriarchy as well. There are a number of benefits to employing intersectionality and Kiriarchy together as an integrated framework. The immediate benefit to integrating intersectionality and Kiriarchy is for the conceptual clarity the two offer when used together. Kiriarchy, as outlined previously, describes a multifaceted power structure and allows us to understand power as a function of multiple axes of identity and privilege. Rather than focusing on one, for example, as with gender and patriarchy or race and white supremacy, which is inadequate for understanding the complexity of lived experience. Simply put, Kiriarchy describes the power structures intersectionality generates. We read that one more time. Simply put, Kiriarchy describes the power structures intersectionality generates. In turn, Kiriarchy creates intersectional identities and lived experiences determined by multiple, sometimes conflicting, axes of identity, where patriarchy is understood as the force shaping and perpetuating gendered oppression. Patriarchy uh, originally referred to male governance or male leadership, but in academia these days it refers to a society which is basically run and dictated by men or dominated by male interests. Where patriarchy is understood as the force shaping and perpetuating gendered oppression, kiriarchy is understood as a structure shaping intersectional oppression. Ergo, for a conceptual framework to comprehensively and clearly incorporate an understanding of the multifaceted nature of privilege and marginality, people who are at the margins of society and therefore are not generally privileged or even taken into account. Both are best employed. An integrated framework also improves our capacity to examine individual experiences of marginality and vulnerability within the context of structural power. An intersectional study that draws from Kiriarchy to establish its theory of structural power can demonstrate how intersectional identities and in turn lived experiences are produced and experienced through Kiriarchy. A kiriarchal study may draw from intersectionality in order to understand how the experiences of this structural power are shaped by the intersection of identity groups at the individual level. Kiriarchy does not conflate or collapse all structures of oppression into a single undifferentiated structure. Different structures can have distinct functions that shape how they operate and, although the structures interact, share similarities and co-constitute each other, meaning they, together, they, they each work to bring about the other. At times, it is prudent to engage in strategic essentialism, meaning essentialism employed as a strategy. Colonialism operates quite differently to heterosexism. Heterosexism is the more standard academic term for what is commonly called homophobia, as one example. And so it can be useful to foreground a particular axis 
axis meaning intersection when seeking to understand how it functions and and is perpetrated again that is by Natalie Osborne from a journal article the title of which is intersectionality and Kiriarchy a framework for approaching power and social justice in planning and climate change adaptation. This next article is by Nathan Dawthorn. Just so you, you know that it's not only women who write articles on, on, on Kiriarchy and intersectionality. Kimberly Crenshaw and Bell Hooks, two extraordinarily brilliant scholars. I especially love Bell Hooks. What a brilliant, brilliant woman. Among other feminists of color have helped shape the social sciences by calling out how a singular and exclusive focus on the oppression of women replicates colonial, right, colonialism, colonial discourses that silence marginal and dissenting voices. That's what colonialism does, right? Anybody who is not in the centers of power is ignored by colonialism. The concept of intersectionality helped illustrate how black women do not have the same experiences as white women or black men, both groups who have established activist organizations. As a person occupies many social locations. Social locations meaning uh, positions in society, like your job, like your place in the family, like your place in, in, an, in, a, in, a, in a voluntary organization, like a lodge, for example, or an association, anything, anything along, uh, along, along that line. As a person occupies many social locations, the intersection of these culminates into an experience greater than the sum of its parts. These standpoints make politics based on one identity inadequate as they ignore other forms of oppression. Some of these axes, again axes intersections, include race, ethnicity, religion, class, sexuality, gender identity, expression, conformity, there are slashes between those, relationship, ability, body size or type, and age. Expanding on these is Patricia Hill Collins' Matrix of Domination, which looks at the overall structure of power in society and attempts to move beyond black and white dualistic thinking, accounting for shades of gray, nuance, context, and the non-hierarchical, meaning there are some positions which are on roughly the same level in terms of power, privilege, prestige, and wealth. To help address issues of dominance and subordination between women, Elizabeth Schutzer Fiorenza, again the originator of the concept of Kiriarchy, developed the idea of Kiriarchy to move away from patriarchy as an analytical tool to recognize complex systems of oppression and privilege that shape experiences. Now, final quotation. I bet you're waiting for this one. This is by William, and I have no idea how to pronounce the guy's last name, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, Mofu? I don't know. That's probably wrong. It's M-P-O-F-U and Melissa Stein. The Trouble with the Human. And the article is called Decolonizing the Human, Reflections from Africa on Difference and Oppression. Again, that's an article in a collected volume. In her concept of the Kiriarchy, Elizabeth Schutzer Fiorenza has helpfully coined a word for interacting, interlocking, 
systems of domination and subordination that inform the modern world. As a pyramidal system, the Kiriarchy includes not only sexism, racism, and heteronormativity, but also, among other things, militarism and anthropomorphism. Now, I'm sorry, anthropocentrism. Let me go ahead, let me go back and uh, explain what those terms heteronormativity and anthropocentrism are. Heteronormativity, which is similar to the notion of homophobia, for example, a uh, very similar concept, but it's based on the idea that, that in most modern Western societies, and many societies in other parts of the world as well, um, the standard for what it means to be a human being is set by the heterosexual. So, for example, if you were asked to close your eyes and picture a person, most people, this has been studied, will picture a heterosexual white man. That is also true among black people. That is also true among women. They will picture a heterosexual white male. Not very nice. Anthropocentrism is a view of society, or even more broadly, a view of the universe, which is centered on men. Uh, in other words, that, that, that the man is the center of everything, uh, including women, including children, including animals. That is anthropocentrism. The vaunted human has endangered the climate and sparked an ecological crisis that threatens the very existence of the human species. The animal kingdom plants life, water, and air. The trouble of the human. We are trouble. We human beings are trouble. The trouble of the human is therefore not only an internal human family matter, but also an external ecological crisis that has disturbed and provoked nature, climate change and other things like that, making the world a dangerous place for the human and for other life forms. And when we see this horrendous climate change, this article uh, was written back in 2008. As I speak right now, that's that's 15 years ago. Things were nowhere near as bad 15 years ago as they are right now. Right here where I live, in the Rio Grande Valley of Deep South Texas, I live in the, in the warmest county in Texas, Hidalgo County. I am literally three miles down the road from Mexico. When I moved here, there had not been a hailstorm in decades. Within a month, we had three. That's climate change. Climate change is going to get worse and worse. Um, within decades, many island nations will simply no longer exist. They will be completely immersed in the water. The same thing will eventually happen uh, to uh, the Florida Peninsula. There will be no more Florida Peninsula. I guess the Florida Panhandle might exist, but the Florida Peninsula will literally be gone. It is, it is a genuine tragedy, and it is a tragedy that we as human beings have caused. We, we simply cannot blame anybody except ourselves. We are the ones who caused the problem. We are the ones who elected people into positions of power, and they are the ones who have decided to go along the route of making money or giving money to large corporations which pollute the environment, as opposed to electing politicians who are in favor of eliminating climate change, or at least minimizing it. 
I don't know if it's possible to completely eliminate it, but at least we can minimize it, um, slow it down or something, hoping for a time when maybe, just maybe, we have a way to clean this atmosphere up. Now, I don't know if that will happen, but that's certainly a dilemma that we have gotten ourselves caught into. And um, sadly, if we as humans become extinct on the Earth, it is our own fault. If we as humans approach extinction on Earth, there's no place else to go. We have no spaceships to travel intergalactically to other planets, or if there are any, nobody told me. Um, so we may end up having a planet filled with cockroaches. Uh, they are, are very resilient species. Uh, they might be one of the few creatures left on this planet long after human beings are gone. So we really need to be concerned about these things. So again, the whole notion of kiriarchy is taking intersectionality, which again is a model, not a theory, it's a model, and expanding it to include things like imperialism, hegemony, colonialism. The reason why I left third campism, aside from the fact of being disillusioned with it for all sorts of other reasons, is because I realized that in third campism there were only two camps of imperialist powers. NATO and Russia. Well, before there was a modern Russia, those two camps of powers were uh, NATO and the Soviet Union. During World War II, when the Soviet Union was a part of the Allied powers, you had the Allied powers as the first camp and the Axis powers as a second. In other words, it is, it is a very, very inconsistent theory. It's like it blows with the winds. And, and who's to say that there are only two camps of imperialist powers? Why not more? I, I don't know. And when it got to the point that I simply could not answer that question, I abandoned third campism. And to be honest, I haven't regretted it. I liked abandoning it. And, and now I regard myself as a kind of Marxist universalist, meaning I reject tendencies uh, as a parochial phenomenon, meaning as a limiting phenomenon. And I see value in all tendencies, potentially. And I think we need to be open to learning from people as diverse as Stalin, as Trotsky, as Mao, and, and so on. Why are there these wars, these intellectual wars between tendencies? In what other science does this kind of warfare occur? Now, certainly there are scientists who disagree with each other, but not entire tendencies of scientists who are literally at war with each other all the time. That's very, very rare. Imagine if in physics you had mechanistic physics, which is Newtonian, you had phys physicists who supported uh, Einstein's theories, his two theories of relativity, and then you had quantum physicists, and they were all at war with each other. In fact, that's not the way it is. All these different types of physicists recognize value in other types, and they work with each other, and they incorporate information from these other types of physics. So why can't we do that in scientific socialism? Why is it so hard for us to get rid of our reliance upon charismatic authority, the authority of a charismatic or magnetic personality like Stalin, like Lenin, like Trotsky, like Mao Zedong? Why is it so hard for us to get rid of that? Well, I think what that does, and I know from speaking with people who are not Marxists, it makes us look like fools. And if anything is evidence that we are not behaving 
in a scientific manner, that is it. So I think that basically just abandoning all this stuff, abandoning third campism, uh, 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 rejecting Trotskyism as the exclusive way of acquiring knowledge in scientific socialism, ditto for Marxism-Leninism, ditto for Marxism-Leninism-Maoism, ditto for Marxism-Leninism-Titoism, and on and on and on. Reject it. It does not belong within the currency, within the proper currency, in my own personal opinion, of what it, it should mean to be a Marxist in the 21st century. Thank you very much. This is Mark A. Foster. Have a pleasant day and a pleasant evening.